السلام علیکم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ڈیئر اینڈ ریسپیکٹڈ ویورس ویلکم بیک ٹو آر فورم وی ہیو سو فار کورڈ فور سیگمنٹس آف آر نیریٹو اباؤٹ مسٹر جیناز لائف اینڈ ٹوڈے وی امبارک اپون دا ففتھ اینڈ وی اسٹارٹ ود دا خلافت موومنٹ Lloyd George, the British war premier, had given solemn pledges to Indian Muslims. Nor are we fighting to deprive Turkey of the rich lands of Asia Minor and Thrace, which are predominantly Turkish in race. These promises remained unfulfilled, and Jaziratul Arab, including Mesopotamia, Arabia, Syria and Palestine with their holy places instead of remaining under the caliph of Islam were being dismembered. Thrace went to Greece, Britain and France divided among themselves the Asiatic portions of the Turkish Empire and the caliph became a virtual prisoner. This betrayal on the part of British Premier angered the Muslims particularly the Indian Muslims who depending on them went and fought against their brothers in Islam. So said Maulana Muhammad Ali Jahar. Muslims had been tried to the limit to bear the indignities and hardships heaped on their heads by the British. Maulana Muhammad Ali Jahar who according to Afzal Iqbal had the heart of Napoleon, the tongue of Burke, and the pen of Macaulay. While addressing a meeting organized in Paris on the Khilafat question on 21st March 1920, said, We have come here merely to ask you to spare us the one thing which to us is more than territories, the one thing which is more than all financial resources. That is the liberty of our conscience. Khilafat is not merely a Turkish question. It is an Islamic question, an Indian question, an Algerian question, and a Tunisian question. It is the preservation of the Khilafat. Qaeda Azam did not show any enthusiasm whatsoever for Gandhi's leadership of the Khilafat movement. while Maulana Muhammad Ali seemed to have fallen under Gandhi's spell, who became the main voice of the Khilafat movement. Thus, the destinies of 100 million Muslims of the country were voluntarily placed in the hands of a man who only by a stretch of the imagination could be regarded as their well-wisher. This was Jena's candid assessment of the situation. Now let's review, uh, my dear viewers, Gandhi's Khilafat pronouncements and addicts. He thought he had become the overall leader, which for a while he had become of the Khilafat movement. Gandhi, dictator of the Khilafat movement, enunciated his program of non-violent, non-cooperation. to fight the battle for restoration of the Khilafat, including boycott of British goods, voters not to vote at elections, boycott of litigations and courts by lawyers and litigants, labor strikes on an all India basis, students were to boycott schools and colleges. In their enthusiasm, Muslims supported Gandhi's program including Aligarh, the intellectual citadel of the Muslim India, where hundreds of students gave up their studies, while its counterpart, the Hindu University at Banaras, kept its students and professors away from the frolics of their own Mahatma. To climax it, my dear viewers, Gandhi said, and if the Khilafat wrong still remain unredressed 
the Muslims were to migrate en masse from India. The fact that this last item in the program of Gandhi appealed to thousands of Muslims who fell into the trap laid by him as a measure of the confidence they had in his honesty and sincerity. They did not pause to think whether or not this Hindu leader was aiming at getting rid of Muslims from India under the Khilafat pretext in order to make India safe for the Hindus. At this juncture, Jinnah decided to go it alone. The following month, Jinnah resigned from the Home Rule League along with 19 others as a protest against Gandhi's palpably wrong ruling as the chairman of a Home Rule meeting. Gandhi wrote to him to reconsider his decision, but Jinnah's mind now on the brink of momentous decisions which were to introduce new dimension in the politics of the subcontinent. And it is therefore important to note that Jinnah wrote to Gandhi in reply, I thank you for your kind suggestion offering me to take my share in the new life that has opened up before the country. If by new life you mean your methods and your program, I'm afraid I cannot accept them, for I'm fully convinced that it must lead to disaster. Gandhian influence and the Muslim sentiment. My dear viewers, you must follow this segment very closely as to what Gandhi wanted to do and what his plans were. By the time the Congress and League session met simultaneously at Nagpur in December 1920, the Khilafat movement and the Congress was so much under the influence of Gandhi that he had become a powerful force and the Muslim League had comparatively become weaker in the face of this combination. The politically and religiously extreme sections of Muslims were with the Khilafat and therefore under Gandhi's influence, their stand had made the Muslim League a weakened force in the country. The special session of the Congress held at Calcutta on 4th to 9th September 1920 had adopted a resolution in deference to Gandhi's wishes. In spite of bitter opposition from some delegates, a resolution calling upon the congressmen to refrain from contesting elections under the new reforms and the voters from recording their votes was passed. However, when the elections were held, about 80% of the voters, Hindus and Muslims, groaning under the atrocities of the Punjab administration and frustrated at Britain's betrayal of Muslims over the Khilafat question, boycotted the polls. Finally, Jinnah parts ways for good. The Nagpur session was largely responsible for the subsequent cleavage between Congress and Muslim League. As Gandhi with almost religious rigidity forced those that did not agree with his views to embrace his creed and to accept him as a resurrected messiah. However, an omnibus resolution drafted by Gandhi was adopted, changing the creed of the Congress in spite of opposition from those that were not of his way of thinking. Jinnah made a violent attack on the resolution as a whole and on some specific features of it with his usual shrewd analysis of the political situation and the future that was before and in store for India as he saw it. As Jinnah rose to address that vast ocean of humanity, his first words were, I rise to oppose the resolution. There was uproar of disapproval from Gandhi's followers. He again said, I rise to oppose the motion. 
Once again, he was prevented from speaking. But Jena kept his ground, undaunted by the hoarse and hysterical cries of the mob. He was a leader. He was not to be dictated by others. He knew his mind. On his third attempt, he raised his voice all the more and thundered his opposition to the resolution. Gradually, his courage and his heroic temperament quietened his audience and he proceeded to express his views amidst complete silence. He had won their admiration for his courage, for everyone loves a hero, but he did not win their votes. The creed of the Congress up to the Nagpur session had been to bring about by constitutional means the steady reform of the existing system of administration and by national unity. And Gandhi's resolution sought to change it to the object of the Indian National Congress. The resolution said, the object of the Indian National Congress is the attainment of Swaraj by the people of India by all means was what Gandhi wanted people to believe and act upon. Chamanlal Stalwad writes, Jinnah strongly opposed this change and boldly stood his ground in spite of violent opposition from a large part of the audience. After this, Jinnah parted with the Congress and never returned to it. Gandhi's espousal of Khilafat, my dear viewers, is tantamount to a travesty of Islamic faith. It seems strange that Muslims should have agreed to place their destinies over the Khilafat in the hands of a man who wrote, I call myself a Sanatani Orthodox Hindu because firstly, I believe in the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Puranas, and all that goes in the name of Hindu scriptures. Secondly, I believe in the Vamashrama Dharma, the law of the caste system that divides humans into the mighty and the lowly of humans in its Vedic forms. Thirdly, I believe in the protection of the cow as an article of faith. And fourthly, I do not disbelieve in idol worship. Jinnah's defiance to Gandhi and all that he stood for and the way he wanted to lead the Muslims in the Khilafat movement, Mr. Jinnah's defiance came through very strongly. And we would like to see that how Mr. Jinnah's defiance can be profiled. Jinnah was the most outspoken opponent of Gandhi's boycott, a non-violent, non-cooperation resolution, as he wanted the fight against imperialism to be constitutional. That was the way Mr. Jinnah always operated, to be within the confines of law, to be constitutional. In the schools and colleges, in the legislative assemblies, and in the local bodies, Jinnah was in a defiant mood at the Nagpur session. He deliberately dropped the title Mahatama while referring to Gandhi and preferred to call him plain Mr. Gandhi. He seemed to have raised a hornet's nest around his head for thousands of voices shouted, Call him Mahatma! Call him Mahatma! But Mr. Jinnah continued to address the central figure on the desk as Mr. Gandhi, without being overawed or concerned by the hooting of the crowd. During the course of the speech as he proceeded, he referred to Maulana Muhammad Ali Jahar as Mr. Muhammad Ali. The vast crowd was infuriated 
at what they considered to be a double affront and they once again shouted no no call him Maulana Muhammad Ali he said very defiantly I refuse to be dictated by you I am entitled to use my discretion to call a man by whatever designation I choose provided it is parliamentary I do not recognize Mr. Muhammad Ali's claim to be Maulana. He had tamed the mob with the whip of his rebuke and he continued to refer to both of them with their names only as instead of the usual titles prefixed before their names. Mr. G. Alana, a close associate of Mr. Jena, paid a wonderful tribute to Jena on his very brave stand. It is easy, Mr. Alana says, to swim with the tide, delectable to be with the crowd, but it requires moral courage to take a stand on a public issue which is in conflict with that which is held to be popular. But the Qaed was made of stern stuff. He could defy those with whom he disagreed and tread a hazardous path on the uncertain battlefield of politics. Now we come to our dear viewers, a certain event in the history of India which took place along the western coast in the region of Kerala of today which goes by the title of the Mopla Revolt. The difficulty with Gandhi's movement was that while it continued to be based on non-cooperation, it had ceased to be non-violent, exactly as had been predicted by leaders like Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Muslim Moplas on the Malabar coast in Kerala inhabited in large numbers Valvanand and Imad districts. The Moplas' original descendants of Arabs are traditionally volatile and easily roused to defiance if an appeal is made to their religious sentiments. Government clamped with severity the Mopla Outrages Act to suppress popular uprising on the Malabar coast, but it produced the opposite effect. And by August 1921, the insult inflicted by the police on the Thangals or the religious leaders of the Moplas gave rise to bloody riots by the Moplas, many of whom had swords and some even firearms. Clashes between them and the government developed on a military scale and the Moplas gave the government a protracted fight by restoring to guerrilla warfare. In October, a ruthless martial law gripped the entire territory where the Moplas lived. The rising of the Muslims on the Malabar coast cost them many lives and resulted in monetary losses running into a colossal amount. During this period, the British perpetrated on the Moplas a barbarity akin to the historic Black Hole of Calcutta, earning for themselves one more chapter of notoriety by enabling the people to write another deathless page of glory in their struggle for independence. The British bureaucratic and military administration, disregarding of Indian feelings, were bent on bringing the unbending Mopolas to their knees. Cruel and ruthless handling of Mopola revolt and similar imperial dispensation elsewhere in India had completely shattered mutual trust between the British government and the common man. Jinnah was not to be daunted in his cherished dream that Swaraj could be achieved most speedily only through Hindu-Muslim understanding. On the one hand, and then an agreement between that 
symbolize the unity of the peoples and the government on the other hand, mainly due to his efforts in all parties conference was convened in Bombay on 14th, 15th and 16th January 1922 with Mr. Sir M. Viswaraya as chairman and Jinnah as one of the three secretaries. The conference adopted a unanimous resolution condemning the repressive policy of the government and demanded a round table conference between the government and the Congress over the release of prisoners over the Khilafat question and martial law in the Punjab and the all important question of Swaraj. Mr. G.A. Alana in his famous book, The Story of a Nation, says this about the whole episode. In order to create favorable conditions for the convening of such a conference, it was demanded that criminal law amendments and seditious meeting act be forthwith withdrawn. The work and resolution of the conference was severely criticized by Sir S. Nair, while Jinnah, along with the other two secretaries, Jayakar and Nataranjan, gave a spirited statement to the press in reply, defending decisions arrived at by the All Parties Conference. The entire exercise from its conception, organization and execution owed its success to none other but Mr. Jinnah. My dear reviewers, I'm sure that today's segment that was packed with a lot of information must have opened up a lot of new vistas on the leadership qualities of Mr. Jinnah, his bravery, his boldness and his absolute sincerity in always standing with the truth. Hope you will look forward to our future presentations which will keep coming till we have completely given out or narrated the story of our Qaeda Azam, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Thank you very much.